Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought it, uh, it would be appropriate to read. Um, this is a big history crowd, isn't it? Um, uh, the march has um, many characters, uh, about a, a dozen major characters in my view. But I thought I'd concentrate on General Sherman, uh, not only because he's historically verifiable, but um, because at the end of his life, he lived right around the corner on 71st Street. I don't know if you knew that. Um, they were living in St. Louis. He and Mrs. Sherman, their older son, went to Yale, enrolled at Yale, and so they moved east and lived at 75 West 71st Street for the last two years of his life. Um, uh, those of you who have little children probably know about the playground nearby, um, here on the west side in Central Park, named the William Tecumseh Sherman Playground. It's a rather peculiar name for a playground. I, But nevertheless, it's there. I'm sure someday someone will mount a campaign to change the name. Maybe the George W. Bush Playground. <laughs> well, anyway, about uh, 20 years ago, I picked up a history of Sherman's March uh, by a historian named Joseph Glathar entitled The March to the Sea and Beyond. And it discussed the event topically, the composition of Sherman's army, the camp life, foraging, the battles, the topography, uh, a lot of documentation of the letters and diary entries of no ordinary soldiers. And I, I remember thinking that the march might serve as an armature for a novel. And over the years, and sat in my mind, not as a devastating military campaign only, uh, with 60,000 Union troops wreaking havoc through Georgia and the Carolinas, but as the calamitous displacement of an entire culture. Nothing like it had ever been seen on this continent, and uh, nothing like it would be seen again except perhaps for Hurricane Katrina. As a military operation, it destroyed the Confederacy's capacity to wage war. But as I imagine it in its cumulative effect with thousands of freed slaves and dispossessed whites attaching themselves to it, the march would have had to become a superseding reality, a, um, a nomadic life form with the power to transform the identities of its uh, participants. And, um, but I didn't do anything about it. You know, we all have ideas in my mind. We, we carry ideas in our minds, and most of them should stay there. <laughs> but every once in a while, one of them um, presses forward. And what happened uh, about three or, three or four years ago is that uh, I happened to run across a photograph of Sherman um, and his staff posing uh, in front of a field tent. And um, that set me off. It's a mysterious moment when um, an idea for a book suddenly uh, coheres and, and you're off and running. At the end, of course, the battling in this war transcended any cause or principle, right or wrong, because at its climax, all the constraints of, of civilized behavior went up in flames. Anyway. Um, I'll pick up um, Sherman as he's uh, approaching um, Savannah, Georgia. Sherman's glasses were turned on Fort McAllister, which guarded Savannah from the south, a formidably risen par parapeted earthwork work with a ravine before it and obstructions of abatis made of felled oak trees and chevaux de frise whose stripped branches had been honed into sharp spikes. It was late in the afternoon. He stood with Morrison, his signal officer, atop a mill roof on the left bank of the river a mile or two distant. 
Above them on the crow's nest, hurriedly constructed by the engineers, was Morrison's signalman, who was in communication with one of Admiral Dahlgren's squadron laying at anchor in Osabo Sound. So the Navy was there with the clothing and shoes, provisions, and mail that the men had been yearning for these many weeks. But it couldn't come up the river till the fort was taken. Entrenched in a great arc of siege in the swamplands south and west of the city, Sherman's 14th, 20th, 17th, and 15th Corps were hunkered down in the pooling sumps of canal water and sand. His men were cold and miserable and hungry, having marched through a barren, sandy territory that devolved into waterlogged rice plantations where there was no forage to be had. They couldn't light fires to warm themselves lest they invite grape shot from the rebel guns. Miles behind them was the wagon train with the hardtack and coffee and beef on the hoof, but nothing could move forward into this chilled, watery lowland until the city was taken. Your division will storm Fort McAllister, Sherman had told General Hazen. I won't fuddle about. I've come this far and my army wants its prize. We take McAllister and we'll have Savannah. Now he saw Hazen's regiment moving into position through the woods and halting at its edge. Signal Admiral Dahlgren, the assault is about to begin, Sherman said. Then order Hazen to begin. Yes, let it begin, let it begin, Sherman said. Within moments, the blue lines appeared in parade at the edge of the open land and began their advance. A quick trot, arms at the ready, through the fields in the late afternoon sun toward the fort some 800 yards away. Rebel Napoleons immediately boomed forth their round shot. The lines he saw now were converging from three directions, north, south, and along the capital, colors flying. My God, they're magnificent, Sherman cried. Within moments, the smoke of the big guns enveloped the scene like fog drift, and the wind brought to Sherman the pungency of blown powder. And now only the caprices of the wind would let him see discreet moments of the action, tantalizing glimpses as if he thought the smoke were the diaphanous dance veil of the war goddess. And I'm seduced, Sherman said aloud, to startle Morrison. Yet even from these glimpses, Sherman saw things that assured him the assault would succeed. The rebels had left fallen trees in the field where his men could take cover and return fire. And the big guns were without embrasures. His sharpshooters would kill the artillerists. And as he listened, the tempo of shot and shell seemed to slow. The white smoke of the battle began to lift, and now he could see his men clambering up the glacis from the ravine, some of them blown into the air by torpedo mines embanked there. But the blue lines came on, more and more of them, and the parapet was gained. He could see the fighting hand to hand. Sherman had to lower his glass to overcome, to watch. He loved a brave man. Regiments of them brought sobs of joy. How many minutes later it was when Captain Morrison called out, it's ours, sir, I see the colors. And it was true. All at once the firing ceased and they heard a great shout over the field. And through his glass Sherman saw his men waving their fists and firing their muskets into the sky. It was dark when Sherman arrived at the fort. He made his inspection and complimented the defending commander a young major who admitted that he had not expected an attack so late in the day. The moon had risen, throwing a chill white light over the dead who lay where they had fallen. But among them lay his own sleeping soldiers. Sherman's men had found foodstuffs and wine in the cellars, and now they slept. Sitting with crossed legs on a barrel, a cigar in one hand and a cup of wine in the other, Sherman contemplated how matter-of-factly his men accepted the dead that they could lie down so casually beside them, all of them asleep, though some forever. He barely noticed the coat thrown round his shoulders by his servant, Moses Brown. His thoughts ran this way. What if the dead man dreams as the sleeper dreams? How do we know there is not a posthumous mind, or that death is not a dream state from which the dead can't awaken? And so they are trapped in the hideous universe of such looming terrors as I have known in my nightmares. The only reason to fear death is that it's not a true, insensible end of consciousness. That is the only reason I fear death. In fact, we don't know what it is other than a profound humiliation. We're not made to appreciate it. As a general officer, I consider the death of one of my soldiers